Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa In this presentation, I want to talk about Buddhism in Thailand. It's a big topic, but it's quite interesting. One thing we need to clarify at the beginning is the distinction between Thailand as a country and the Thai people. This is because often when you see anything written or hear anything about early Buddhism in Thailand, uh, it's not actually referring to the Thai people, because the Thai people did not come into Thailand before they migrated in the 12th to 13th century from the north. Before the Thais were in that country that we now call Thailand, it was divided roughly into two areas. In the north, it was under the Khmer Empire out of Cambodia, and it had that influence. So there's a lot of archaeological finds in northern Thailand. They find Hindu and Mahayana sculptures and images because that was coming out of the, the influence of the Khmers. In the south was a country called Tararati, which was a Mon civilization, and they were more Theravada, although, curiously, based on the um, art styles, they seem to have been followers of the Amaravati branch of Sri Lankan Buddhism. In the lecture on Sri Lankan Buddhism, we saw that there were two rival schools, the Mahavihara and Amaravati. Although they were both Theravada, the Amaravati school was very unorthodox, and over time they drifted into Mahayana uh, ways of thinking. So none of Thailand before the Thais came in was what we would call mainline Theravada. The Thai people came from southern China, probably Guangxi province, and were driven south by the Han expansion, as the Han Chinese expanded into the territory of what's now China. The, there was many ethnic groups were driven out and put on the road. It's now thought that the Thais originally came from the island of Taiwan, and that they have a strong component in their ethnicity of Austronesians, like the Polynesian sort of people. But they were certainly interbred and culturally influenced uh, by China quite a bit before they came into Thailand. There's a legend, a mythical origin of the Thai people that I've seen different versions of. They have a mythical culture hero called Kun Barom, who was the founder of the race, and he was either a, a uh, in some versions, he's a deity sent down from heaven, in other versions, he's just a great hero. Uh, in one version, he had a, a, a magical water buffalo that plowed the first rice fields, and when it died, they cut it open, and the Thai people came out of it. And the Thais spreading out from Guangxi province, spread also into other places. Uh, very closely related people are the Lao and also the, the Shan people. They all uh, came from that initial migration and they all speak similar languages. So the Thais moving into Thailand gradually uh, settled the whole area. The first major Thai state was the Sukhothai Kingdom, founded in 1238. They had an early king, Ram Kamahang, 1279 to 98, who is still considered to be a great hero in Thai history, a great founder of the Thai culture and civilization. He's the one who made Theravada the official state religion. 
and uh, encouraged the propagation of Theravada Buddhism. Part of his reasoning may have been purely political in order to establish a clear distinction and separation from his more powerful neighbors, the Khmers. The alphabet used in Thailand is credited as having been designed by King Ram Kamaheng based on Indian models, and it follows the, um, the same sort of alphabetic sequence as Indian alphabets, but it's unique to Thailand. There is a legend of the birth of King Ram Kamaheng that he was, although he was officially the son of the previous king, the legend had it that his mother was actually a Yakini, a female Yaka, who had mated with a fisherman, and that he was some kind of foundling that was raised to be the king. So this is, for whatever else it's worth, an indication that he is so powerful and important a figure in Thai history, both in religion and in culture and politics, that the Thais felt the need to give him a supernatural origin. One of the things that he did during his reign was to send some monks to Sri Lanka. And we saw this previously with the Burmese history, that there was a constant exchange of monks back and forth between Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka. And the monks that came back instituted what was called the Lankawang lineage, Lanka referring to Sri Lanka. So this was, uh, again, a seeding of the Mahavihara tradition into Thailand. It occurred at this time, you know, quite early in the actual history of Thailand, in the late 13th century. And he also instituted the, uh, the position of Sangharaja that still exists to this day. Sangharaja, meaning like king of the Sangha, he's the head monk, works closely with the king and oversees the, um, the religion in the country. And this is something that we see as a theme in Thai history, close relationship between uh, the Buddha Sangha and the state, particularly the monarchy. And it's probably more so than in other Buddhist countries. The next important king for uh, Buddhist history uh, was King Mahatamaracha, who reigned from 1346 to 1368. And he wrote the book, The Three Worlds According to King Rung. This is a, a cosmological treatise describing the different realms of existence. And it was really the first major a literary Buddhist work done in the Thai language in Thailand. Another uh, smaller Thai kingdom that was quite important that existed contemporary with Sukhothai was the Lan Na kingdom with its capital at Chiang Mai. And they were ethnically Thai and you know linguistically Thai, but had their own tradition and their own civilization for a long time, an independent state. And it was there that the uh, Emerald Buddha was uh, housed. And th this is now in Bangkok. It's a very beautiful Buddha image. And it has a, a legendary origin that there was, according to the legend, there was a stupa that was hit by lightning and when it crumbled from the lightning strike, they found this uh, plaster image of a Buddha, quite crude plaster image of a Buddha, and the king had it moved into the palace. And one day he noticed some of the plaster was chipping off, so he had his workmen strip the plaster off, and there was this beautiful emerald Buddha underneath. This uh, emerald Buddha has been moved a couple of times, it's, it's, it's been a prize in the wars between the different uh, local kings, which is something we see in uh, Southeast Asian history. We saw it also in Burma, that when one country defeats another in war and conquers it, they'll take the sacred objects back to their home country.
Also at this time, in Lan Na, towards the end of this period, there was a new sect established out of Sri Lanka, and they were at odds with the older lineage because the older lineage had fallen off from following strict Vinaya. They were handling money and owning rice lands. This is something we see in religious history quite often. It also occurs in Christian history. You'll see a lineage of monks that starts out as a reform movement and is very pure and straight, but then over time they become corrupted by their own success. They gain wealth and power and they kind of slide. And then you get newer forms coming up, starting the cycle again. So the Sukhothai uh, period ended in uh, 1351 when they were conquered by the Ayutthaya kingdom to the south, which was another Thai kingdom, and it was the most uh, important Thai state from 1351 to 1767. Ayutthaya, and Ayutthaya, at, by the early 1700s, was such a big city that historians think it, it may have been the largest city in the world at the time, with uh, up to a million population. So this shows that Thai civilization by this time had become very sophisticated and uh, complex, if they can support a city of a million people. Uh, one of their uh, early kings, Utong, who reigned from 1351 to 1369, he again uh, followed the Sukhothai model and established Theravada as the official religion. And he also instituted the a legal code that was called the Dharma Sastra, that was based on Indian models the, like the laws of Manu. And this... Uh, legal code was in effect until well into the 20th century and still has a, a, a basis in Thai law, legal practice. And again, in the mid-1400s, we have another infusion from Sri Lanka of reform. Another new lineage was started called Waranatana Wagaset. So this once again repeats the theme that comes up again and again in these histories. One of the kings of the 15th century, King Boromata Trilokanat, uh, he promoted this sect and he personally spent eight months as a monk. And this uh, is an, also a repeated theme in, in Thailand. There's a couple of things here that are uniquely Thai. One is that you have the institution of temporary ordination. This is not seen at all in Sri Lanka, that um, men will ordain as bhikkhus for a limited period of time without the intention of staying for life. And, and uh, uh, it became a custom that uh, young men would ordain for one rainy season in their early manhood, and it was kind of like a rite of passage, and that you weren't considered to be fully adult and ready for responsibility and for marriage and so on until you had gone through a rainy season as a bhikkhu. And the other point here is that a king took ordination, and this has been done by many Thai monarchs subsequently, that they will take temporary ordination. So this is, again, the very close Thai between the monarchy and the Sangha in Thailand. Also during his reign, another great literary production of Thai uh, Buddhism was produced. This was an epic poem on the Vasantara Jataka, which is still a very beloved theme in Thailand. The Vasantara Jataka recounts the story of the Bodhisattva's last human birth before becoming the Buddha when he was a prince who perfected the barami of dana, of giving, or generosity, by making a resolute vow to um, never refuse anyone a gift when asked. And this immediately got him in trouble because uh, some beggar asked him for the royal elephant and he gave it away. So his people were so upset they threw him out and he had to live in the forest with his wife and two sons. And 
uh, one of the details of the story that upsets a lot of Westerners is that he gave away his wife and two sons as well. But it's a very uh, a moving story in in that there has been a tradition in Thailand, which I think is pre I think is pretty much extinct now. But there was a tradition that some monks would memorize the. Uh, this long, it's actually a very long jataka. They memorize this epic, uh, either the Thai, you know, the Thai version of the epic and and recite it with very moving uh, inflections and bring people weeping to tears. In the uh, 17th century, also now we're still in the Ayutthaya period, uh, there was established the, an examination system for monks where monks would have to take a uh, oral test of translating Pali passages into Thai. So there was a, a, a attempt from this period on to regulate the quality of the Sangha. And there's still an examination system in Thailand, although it's evolved quite a bit. We'll talk about uh, uh, that a bit later in the Bangkok period. In the early 1700s, after the Sri Lankan Sangha had declined a great deal and was in crisis, and there was actually no legitimate monks left in Sri Lanka by the early 1700s, it was the Thai monks who went to Sri Lanka and re-established the ordination there. And this became the Samanakaya in uh, Sri Lanka, which is still one of the lineages that exists there today. But while Theravada Buddhism was thriving and established and respected part of society, there was also a kind of underground Buddhism that was called the Yoga Vichara, sometimes called esoteric Buddhism, that incorporated uh, magical elements and maybe had some, uh, some tantric influence and may have been influenced originally by the Khmer civilization. I know that even at the present day in Thailand, uh, there are individuals who have certain magical rites that they perform, particularly healing, like snake doctors and bone doctors, and who do uh, you know, magical healings of people. And the, the mantras that they recite as part of their ritual are in Old Khmer, which is regarded in Thailand as a kind of magical language. So this yoga yoga vachara uh, tradition never really quite died out, even though at a later period in uh, Chulalongkorn's time, which we'll get to, there was an attempt to suppress it. So the Ayutthaya civilization was plagued throughout the latter part of its uh, existence with constant wars with Burma. On and off, they were constantly battling with the Burmese. And in the final war of this period, uh, the Burmese were victorious and they sacked and looted Ayutthaya and the, the kingdom fell. One of the uh, traditions that came out of these wars was the reason why Thai monks shaved their eyebrows. Because at, at one point, the, uh, the king of Thailand uh, was told that the Burmese had infiltrated the country with spies who were dressed as bhikkhus and were wandering up and down the roads to make maps and study military positions and so on. And so he came up with a plan how they were going to catch all these Burmese spies. And, and because it's worked because of the close relationship between the monarchy and the, the Sangha. He had word sent down through the, the hierarchy in the Sangha to tell all the monks on the next Oposa today, when they shave their heads, also shave their eyebrows. So then any monks walking around with eyebrows, they would know were Burmese spies. And they were fake monks. They were just spies for Burma, and they were caught and put to death. And it was successful, but the because it worked, it, I guess the king forgot about it. He never rescinded the order. So the, the Thais, you know, loving tradition and loving the monarchy, they... You know, they, they never told to stop, so they just keep doing it to the present day. Then, after Ayutthaya fell, 
the Thai people managed to regroup and reform. And the first leader was a man called Taksin, who reigned from 1767 to 1782. He had been a general under the last Ayutthaya king, and uh, he, uh, he was crowned as a king and established his capital in Thornbury. And he was quite uh, a dynamic character, quite successful in uh, restoring the fortunes of the Thai state and uh, driving out the Burmese. But unfortunately, in the last period of his reign, he went kind of mad. He went sort of crazy. And part of this was a sort of religious hysteria where he inconsistently claimed to be both a Sotapanna and a Bodhisattva. And if you understand Theravada soteriology, there's no possible way an individual can be both a Bodhisattva and a Sotapanna. And he ordered that the monks have to bow down to him. And uh, many of them refused, and he had some of them punished. And he became very uh, dictatorial and lost his popularity and esteem. And he was overthrown by one of his own generals and uh, put to death. Although there's also a story that uh, he wasn't never actually put to death. He was the, it was a fake and they, uh, they spirited him away and just kept him and let him retire in hiding. But nobody really knows. And the, uh, the general who took over established the Chakri dynasty, which is still the reigning dynasty in Thailand today and has been very successful and continues down to the present. So they, they began their reign in 1782, and all their kings are generally known to history by a short form. They're just called Rama I, Rama II, Rama III, although some of the more important ones we hear about also uh, get known by their uh, more personal name. Rama I established, uh, re-established the, uh, the position of Sangharaja, and he had the Pali Canon translated into Thai for the first time. At the end of the 18th century is the first time the Pali Canon was translated from Pali into Thai. He uh, also uh, reinstituted and modernized the examination system for monks. Many of his reforms were like this in you know, tightening up the state regulation of the Sangha. Another of his uh, institutions that still exists to the present was that every monk has to be issued a ID card, a, a passport, a, a monk's passport kind of thing too. And uh, here's an example. This is my Thai passport. My, uh, it's called a Baisuti. It's my Thai monk's passport. And it certifies that I'm a bona fide uh, bhikkhu ordained in Thailand. Every monk had to be associated with a monastery. There was not allowed to be free-range monks that weren't, uh, weren't part of the hierarchical monastic system. And he assumed, as part of these reforms, he assumed the, the right of the state or the monarchy to uh, forcibly disrobe uh, disreputable monks. And 128 monks, which is not a huge number, a country with that many bhikkhus, uh, 128 monks were disrobed during his reign by the order of the state for not living according to Vinaya. The next king, Rama II, 1809 to 1824, refined the examination system, and his basic system is, with some modifications, still in use today. There are nine grades and monks get different titles for passing different grades. It's considered to be something that a diligent bhikkhu will try to get some standing in this examination system, though I think very few monks make it to the ninth grade. He was also concerned that the British ruling in Sri Lanka would undermine Buddhism, and he again sent yet another mission of bhikkhus to Sri Lanka to help them to preserve the Dhamma there. And the next king, Rama III, 1824 to 1851, was mostly known for building temples. 
there was a great deal of building activity of religious buildings in his reign. Then we come to Rama IV, who was also known as King Monquit, a very important figure in Thai history and particularly in relation to Buddhism. He reigned from 1851 to 1868. Before he became king, he was a bhikkhu himself for 27 years, and he never expected to become uh, the king. It was supposed to go to his elder brother, who died and uh, unexpectedly, and they asked Mongkut to take the throne, and he, he agreed. Even before he became king, well, with his connections to the royal family, he, of, of course, was had some influence and power. He founded the Dhammayutaka sect, whose um, head monastery is Wat Baranawat in Bangkok. The Dhammayutaka sect was, and it still exists, it's a, a reform movement because it was felt by Mankut and his circle that the Sangha had grown corrupt, and particularly during the chaotic period at the end of the 18th century with the final war with Burma and the disruption of the whole state. They were afraid that the ordination lineages had been broken and corrupted. For a bhikkhu to be properly ordained, according to Vinaya, he, he must be ordained by five bhikkhus outside the middle country. And all those bhikkhus must be themselves properly ordained. If any one of them is an improper or illegal bhikkhu, then the ordination is invalid. So it was felt by some at the time that the ordination uh, tradition had been broken during the period of chaos of the Burmese wars and that you could not trust that any of the bhikkhus were legitimately uh, ordained in, in the transmission. So King Mongkut and some of the purists around him uh, investigated and decided that there was a group of Mon bhikkhus that uh, had maintained a pure lineage. And they started a, a movement to reordain monks under these, this new uh, tradition or this old rediscovered tradition. And these became the Damayut sect, or the Damayut Nikaya. They currently make up about 10% of the monks in Thailand, and they are one of the two recognized Nikayas, the other being Mahanakai, which means the big group, and it's basically just everybody else. So all the monks in Thailand today are classified as either Mahanakai or Damayut. I heard a story about the, the founding of the Damayut sect, that they were so particular about ordination procedure that they, uh, or at least some of them, uh, held that if even one syllable was chanted wrongly in the ordination chanting, then the ordination was invalid. It, it seems actually a kind of a unrealistic standard, but this was, um, they were striving for this absolute purity. And one of their early people uh, reordained uh, nine times because every time after his ordination he found there was some niggling picky little thing either in the chanting or the the sima or some other aspects of the ceremony that that, that wasn't quite right so the the damayutaka sect are important in that they are um they have a tradition of holding Vinaya properly, and they're usually associated and supported by the upper crust in Thailand, like the monarchy and the nobility. King Mongkut, by the way, is the uh, the monarch who has been lampooned in uh, the West with the play and the, the movie The King and I. That's supposed to be King Mongkut, and it's complete a completely wrong portrait of King Mongkut. And that movie is actually banned in Thailand because it's so insulting to Mongkut. Mongkut was not, definitely not illiterate, ignorant buffoon as shown in the movie. He had, uh, besides his um, a deep study of Buddhism, he also took a great interest in Western science and he was fluent in several languages 
both uh, Oriental languages and Western languages. So uh, King Mongkut is still very much uh, a beloved figure in Thailand. The next king was uh, King uh, Rama V, Chulalongkorn. He was also very important for Buddhism. Uh, he reigned from 1868 to 1910, so the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th. And it was during his reign that the, the Sangha Act was passed, which regulated the affairs of the Sangha. And although the Act has been amended many times and fiddled with, it's still the basis for the state organization of the Sangha hierarchy in Thailand. He promoted um, education of monks, both in Buddhist studies, in Pali studies, and the canon and commentaries, but also in things like uh, science and psychology and so on. He wanted to have well-educated monks. And he established a university, the Chulalongkorn University, for that purpose. One of his uh, relations, I think it was his brother, no, I'm not sure of his exact relationship, but uh, was uh, Prince uh, Wachiwiran Wararat, who was a um, great scholar monk. He ordained and was uh, a very influential person in the Sangha. He wrote the book Entrance to Vinaya that's still used as a basic textbook on Vinaya in Thailand today. However, the uh, type of Buddhism that was promoted in Chulalongkorn's reign was very scripturally based. And they held, for example, that it was no longer possible in this degenerate age for anyone to attain to stream winner or to any of the higher states. This type of view was held, I would say, up until the end of the 19th century and was common in many Buddhist countries, at least in Theravada countries. Also, in Chulalongkorn's reign, there was an attempt to regularize Buddhism in the countryside, in the villages and so on, that, that the um, magical tradition, the Yogacara tradition, was uh, there was an attempt to, to root it out. One of the things that Chulalongkorn did was he ordered a, a monastic libraries to be sent to Bangkok for inspection and any books that were heretical were destroyed and then they, they were sent back only the, the orthodox ones. So there's a great deal of, of literature was lost in this uh, uh, kind of um, quest for purity. I spoke once with a man I met in Bangkok who was working for the UN going to country monasteries in Laos and photocopying their old manuscripts and documents. At the time of King Chulalongkorn, Laos was a French protectorate, so it was not under the power of the Thai Sangha. And a lot of the Yogacara wild and woolly stuff, astrology and magic ceremonies and so on, a lot of this literature still survives in Laos today. At this time in the early 20th century, there began a very important tradition, the Kamatana tradition, the forest tradition. Monks who put an emphasis on meditation rather than study and generally lived in the, in the forest or in remote places. It's uh, often uh, said to have started with Ajahn Sao, who lived from 1868 to 1941, who uh, disputed the official position that it was not possible to attain states of enlightenment in this present age. He popularized the meditation on the syllables Budo, that's still a very common meditation in Thailand, a, a form of Anapanasati where you run this two-syllable mantra, Budo, in the mind. And he was the teacher of uh, Ajahn Mun, who lived from 1870 to 1949 and had more effect in the long run than Ajahn Sao. You know, he was really the root of all the different lineages that uh, came out of the um, Thai forest tradition, Ajahn Li and Ajahn Mahabua. Ajahn Mahabua particularly was his personal disciple. 
Ajahn Chah, 1918 to 1992, was not a direct disciple of Ajahn Mun, although he did spend a brief time, about two weeks, with Ajahn Mun, and he always said later that Ajahn Mun gave him the critical instructions for his meditation. Probably the reason Ajahn Chah did not spend more time with Ajahn Mun was the problem of the lineages, Ajahn Mun's uh, Damayut and uh, Ajahn Chah's Mahanakai. So that would make sense. This is not explicitly stated because it probably was just politeness not to bring it up, but uh, probably the reason that his visit was only two weeks or less than two weeks was to get out of the monastery before the Padimokha ceremony which would have been a problem in Vinaya if having different lineages together. And it's Ajahn Chah, who um, of all the, the Thai monks has had the most uh, global influence. Uh, Ajahn Chah monasteries are now all over the world. So the Thai Buddhism has spread through that, uh, that branch. And the Kamatana or forest tradition is now very respected, but at when it first started, it was considered dangerous and heretical, and uh, they didn't get along with the authorities very well. And it took them a long time to become an accepted uh, and respected, venerated part of Thai Buddhism. So that's uh, pretty much the main lines of, of Thai Buddhism down to the present. There have been in in Thailand, from time to time, various other unorthodox infusions or eruptions from time to time. I already mentioned the Yoga Vichara tradition, and one uh, incident that may have been associated with those people was a very disruptive incident in the early 1900s called the Holy Man's Rebellion that uh, caused um, a great deal of uh, unrest in both uh, Northeast Thailand in Ubon and also in Laos, which basically speaks, they speak the same dialect, they're very culturally close. When some kind of uh, ascetics or holy men originating in Laos began spreading an apocalyptic idea, the world was coming to an end and people had to rise up and throw off the evil authorities and take over. And this actually caused a great deal of damage. It took a long time to put these rebellions down, and some of their ideas were quite mad. At one point, they told people that all the water buffaloes were going to turn into yakas and eat people. So the people started killing the water buffaloes, and this really disrupted the economy for a long time. Because for a rice farmer... A water buffalo is his major capital investment. Another tradition in more recent times is the Dhammakaya movement, not to be confused with Dhammayutaka, we talked about earlier, that's entirely unrelated. The Dhammakaya was founded by a monk called Chandasari in the early 20th century. And there's a very many Dhammakaya centers now, and so they've, there's some overseas, not just in Thailand. They have some very odd teachings that are quite unorthodox, beginning with their meditation system. Recently, or not so recently, you know, within, I think, the last 20 years, there was a um, an article published by someone who was basically a whistleblower who claimed to be an insider in the Dhammakaya and left the movement and said that once you get into the inner circles, they teach a doctrine of uh, a, another apocalyptic doctrine that there's going to be a final battle at the end of the world between the forces of good and evil. And their founder, Chandasaro, is uh, up in one of the high heaven worlds waiting to be reincarnated at the time of the final battle and he'll come down with all his uh, his disciples and they'll conquer the forces of Mara and establish a kingdom of righteousness. So this uh, this is very un, un Buddhist, certainly un Theravada. It's a very um, odd uh, odd kind of way of thinking in a Buddhist uh, Buddhist context. 
But this is again something we have seen again and again looking at Buddhist history, that there are always movements springing up, going off the main line and bringing in heterodox ideas. But in general, Thailand has been since the beginning in Sukhothai times down to the present a very consistently an orthodox Theravada country and the Sangha has been well ordered and organized and closely tied to the monarchy and the state. So this is a brief survey of Thai Buddhism and I, I hope you have enjoyed it. Thank you.